So, uh, let's start with the topic I'm sure uh, is on everyone's minds in this room. I can't imagine what that's <laughs> going to be. Uh, two, two words, two names, Donald Trump. Uh, you've had an interesting relationship with President Donald Trump over the last few years, with him reportedly having sent you an email last year calling you the most disloyal person and vowed to get even with you. How would you comment on this relationship? <laughs> um, well, it's been interesting. Uh, I've known him for, you know, about 20 years. Uh, obviously, I put him on American television with The Apprentice. Uh, uh, I could never have imagined we'd be where we are today. Uh, people ask me that. Um, and so, you know, look, when he decided to run for president, uh, I knew him very well and I understood I understood his appeal because uh, obviously that's what had led The Apprentice to be such a popular show in the United States. So I think we probably took his candidacy more seriously than others did initially because we had, I had some insight into how people felt about him and, and what made him popular. Now he thought just because we had that 15, 20 year relationship as a result of that, and that I'd put him on the, on, on the show, that as a result of that uh, I should uh, just give him a free pass and should be sycophantish in our coverage of him as some American television network is. Um, and, uh, and, you know, it doesn't work that way. Uh, our job is to, is to uh, hold those who are in power accountable and, and hold his feet to the fire. And he hasn't liked that. So he's objected to some of our coverage. Uh, and that's okay. I'm not, I'm not there to be friends. I'm there to do a job. Uh, I'm not looking for any bad relationship. I'm not looking for any uh, uh, issues, but if he objects to the coverage, that's on him, not on us. On a related note, and again, a buzzword is about to arrive. Uh, we live in an era of fake news and an era where the once trusted and well-established outlets like CNN are tossed aside by people, um, including the president himself. And how do you protect the integrity of your journalism yeah. in a world where if you just disagree, you say fake news. Yeah. See, so, I, but I think that's the issue is that, is that we've done a tremendous amount of uh, research on this topic in the past year because I have been nervous that his use of that term might have some negative impact on our brand uh, equity, and it hasn't. And so the good news for CNN is actually people trust us more today than they did a year ago. And I think that's people really do understand now that when he says fake news, he's referring to things that he doesn't like. And I, I, you know, I think initially we were concerned that, that it would, would not be interpreted that way. But I think people get it and they understand. And so our job is to hold him and hold those in, a power, in power accountable. And I think the audience and the viewership and the readers understand that. And so there's been no diminution in the, in the brand equity of CNN over the last year despite the repeated attacks. I think the key for that is to just do our jobs and not be bullied and not be uh, swayed by, by those attacks. On a broader note, how do you think CNN is playing a role in tackling the concept of fake news more generally? Um, it seems to have taken root in our society. Um, and you've talked about how it's affecting the brand of CNN in specifically, but how do you think news should be working to combat that? Well, look, there, there is no question there is a phenomenon of fake news. And I think we've seen that in, uh, in all the reports that have been done about stories that have been uh, put out there on social media platforms that have been planted by uh, uh, competitors and foreign governments. There's no question that that exists. I think it's our job to expose it. I think it's our job to make clear the distinction between what fake news is and stories that someone doesn't like. And I think that's our role. Um, uh, I think we have to expose that. And it's why we put a premium on, you know, making sure that our reporting is right, accurate, and fair. Are we perfect? No, we're not perfect. Do we make mistakes? Yes. Are we human? Yes. When we make mistakes, we need to acknowledge it uh, and correct it and, uh, and go back to doing our jobs. Yeah, I w to touch on that a bit more, Hillary Clinton recently appeared on the Graham Norton Show here in the UK. And she was talking about new, how news was manufactured against her by Russia and how they were filming 
fake news segments and then proliferating this through social media. Um, what do you think about the role of social media in journalism? Yeah. And how do you think social media affected this election in particular? Well, I, I think there's no question that social media is a huge player. It has a huge impact. We say all the time that people are going to find out what's going on from Twitter, but they're going to come to CNN to see if it's true. So what we mean by that is that we don't have to be first with the news because we can't be first in a social media world. Uh, in a world where Twitter is such a big part of, uh, of our lives and, and, and other things. But that's not the game we're playing. They'll find out from Twitter if it's true. They'll come to us to see if it, they'll, they'll, they'll find out first from Twitter and then they'll come to us to see if it's true. That's uh, our role. Social media plays a huge role. I don't think that they have either self-regulated themselves enough or been regulated enough uh, in any way. We are held to very different standards. Advertising on CNN and on television networks is held to a very different standard. There are no such standards in the social media world. That's a lot of the debate that's going on in the United States right now, especially in Congress, as to whether or not there should be uh, standards applied to social media. And I think the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. And related to that, in the UK, news outlets are legally bound to be politically impartial. And do you think this is a better system than the one that you have in the US? Well. Um, you know, look, I think there's, there's, there's advantages and disadvantages to both, right? Uh, I, I, I alluded before to, you know, look, I, I, I think that there's, I think it's certainly within the rights within the United States where, you know, uh, um, freedom of speech is paramount. Uh, and, you know, I think it's, it's right that Fox News can exist uh, and that MSNBC can exist. Neither is impartial. Neither pretends to be impartial. I think, I think the audience understands what they get when they're going to one of those outlets. Just as then CNN exists to, uh, you know, to tell the truth. You know, again, Fox, Fox doesn't tell the truth all the time. MSNBC doesn't tell the truth all the time. Our goal is to try to tell the truth all the time. And, and, you know, I think it's okay that all of that exists in the United States. I wouldn't want there to be laws that uh, didn't allow those other networks to exist. So, you know, are there downsides to it? There are. But I think that, that it's, it's part and parcel of who we are as a country in the United States. I think that's really interesting because if one person is going to one news outlet for their source of information, um, do you not think that that's a problem? Well, this is, I mean, look, so this, is, this is a little bit of what has led to complete partisanship uh, in the United States is that people get their news from sources that reinforce their own political beliefs, right? And, you know, is that, is that problematic? Yes, it's problematic. Has it led to a lot of the paralysis uh, in, in the United States in the political uh, vein? It has. Do I, uh, do, I, do I think that that shouldn't exist? You know, I think it's hard, it's hard, to, it's hard to undo that. Uh, and I think that, you know, uh, a free enterprise, capitalist, free speech society needs to allow those things to, to exist. I think, frankly, the bigger issue with, with the political paralysis that exists in the United States is the gerrymandering of political districts that, that has made, uh, you know, incumbents safe from any uh, opposition. And I think that's a bigger issue than the fact that Fox News uh, or MSNBC exists. Um, on a slightly different note, and probably more personal to you, uh, you've gone on the record to make digital news a priority at CNN, uh, with CNN now ranking as the number one most trafficked news outlet. And there has been an expansion of CNN's social media presence, as we've discussed. What more would you like to achieve on this side of the business? Well, look, this is the huge growth area for us. Uh, um, and uh, it's why we are putting so much time and effort and money behind our digital uh, platforms and products. Uh, we think over the next five to ten years, uh, there will be a dramatic sea change in how people uh, touch us and, and, and interact with us. And we want to be, um, be ready for that. Excuse me. C CNN is calling me. Um, <laughs> they need their president. They, 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 can, wait, they can wait. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, 
so, you know, what we're trying to do is, is just get ready for the tremendous transformation that is going on in society. How everybody here, you know, you get your, you get your news and information from your phone. Uh, and that's, that's just the reality of the world we live in. We want to be part of that. We're, we, we don't really care. We're agnostic as to whether or not you all uh, consume CNN on your television screen, your tablet, your phone. Um, as long as it's got those three little red letters on it, we're good with that. And so that's, uh, that's what we're about and that's how we see the future. How do you see the future of print journalism then? Do you think it's going to become entirely Well, I think defunct? the future of pr print journalism is tough. I do. I think it's tough. Uh, uh, advertising is a, uh, uh, has made print journalism a much more difficult uh, proposition. Subscriptions, uh, subscriptions uh, are, are what are saving that, but it's tough. Uh, we think the future of, of the world is, is mobile and video. And, uh, you know, we're, we're fond of saying that the, the future of mobile is video and the future of video is mobile. And so those two things coming together is really where, where we think the world goes. Um, you know, look, in terms of print journalism, the one thing I'll say is, you know, if you look at outlets in the United States, uh, like the New York Times and the Washington Post, the, you know, they have done an exceptional job in... Uh, in their coverage of, of the Trump administration and, and what's going on. And they deserve a tremendous amount of credit. Um, this is really the heyday uh, of, of American journalism right now. Um, you know, people point to Watergate and the coverage there. This is another really important point in American journalism at a time after most people thought American journalism was going away and print journalism was dead. I think the one thing you can say for sure about Donald Trump is that he's made American journalism great again. <laughs> again, on a, on a personal note, you, and, and on the note of, of video and kind of improving video and making it more engaging and accessible and exciting, you're known for creating the now popular concept of supersizing videos, uh, adding extra minutes to shows to hold the audience. And you also radically transformed the Today Show at NBC. Do you think it's your talent as an innovator within your industry that has led to your current success? Well, I think that uh, um, I've never been afraid to take chances. And so, you know, we took a lot of chances. We changed the Today Show, which is the morning breakfast program in the United States. And, and we, we changed that, made a lot of, uh, introduced a lot of new concepts and a lot of new features. You're referring to when I was running NBC Entertainment, I supersized some of our programs. Friends was the biggest example. It ran 30 minutes. I said, it's our best program. Why don't we make it 40? I went to the uh, cast and the creators of Friends and they looked at me like I was crazy. Um, maybe I was, but nonetheless, they did it and we got 10 extra minutes of audience and ratings out of our most highly rated show. So I thought it made a ton of sense. I think I was driving down like a street in Los Angeles one day and I saw uh, an ad for like McDonald's and it said supersize me. And so I said, well, why don't we just do that to the TV shows? And um, I think, look, I think the common theme to all of those things has been, you know, the thing I hate is when people say, well, we don't do it that way, right? Well, okay. But, you know, oftentimes they'll say that and things aren't working and I'll go, okay, we may not do it that way, but well, the way we're doing it isn't really working, right? And so I think the common theme has been always willing to take a chance, always willing to take a risk. The most important thing through, whether it was at the Today Show or NBC Entertainment or uh, at CNN, has been understanding the legacy of each of those institutions, but not being bound by it. And so, and so you know, understanding the history of the Today Show, understanding the history of CNN, but not, not saying we have to do it the same old way just because that's the way it's always been done here. If you don't change and adapt, then you will be left behind. And I think it's important to recognize and appreciate the history and the legacy of every one of those organizations, but be willing to change them and adapt. Changing history and legacy is an immense job, and I'm sure you've come across an an unsurmountable amount of challenges. So what is the biggest challenge you faced changing these huge dinosaurs well, of the always, media? Well, there's always uh, impediments to, to changing institutions, right? I'm sure it exists at Oxford. Um, 
Okay, maybe not at Oxford. But, um, <laughs> but you know, listen, any, any place that's steeped in history like this, that, that has a certain way of doing it, uh, you know, people are going to object. I think, I think I have had and one needs to have a great deal of um, confidence that it's okay to make a mistake. Like not everything we're going to try in changing something is going to work. But you have to be willing to make that mistake. Then just don't make the same mistake twice if it, if it doesn't work. But if you, don't, if you don't try and you don't adapt, you will, be get, you will get left behind in a new social media world or in a new, uh, you know, in a new world of distribution, whatever. But, but the, the, the biggest challenge is, uh, is always uh, people, people telling you that that's not the way we do it and not succumbing to that. Interesting, thank you. Um, you had a lot of success, as we talked about, overseeing NBC's entire ent entertainment schedule, such as Friends, The Apprentice, Fear Factor, etc. And your era is famed for its ratings, financial success. Um, and on a general note, what do you think makes a successful TV channel? Uh, well, um, I think there's several ways to measure success. You know, clearly the size of the audience is one of them, the, si the profitability of your, of your uh, programs is one, the quality of your programs is another. Uh, so, you know, there's different measures uh, to success uh, for all of those. At CNN, you know, we think about that a lot. It's our audience size, it's our profitability, it's our journalism, um, uh, it's the quality of our programming. I think all of those factors go into it. Uh, I wouldn't want to be, you know, one of those other networks that just, uh, you know, just has ratings but no credibility, right? <laughs> Um, that's, that's, not a, that's not a game that I think is a long-term viable uh, play. And moving on, again, talking about the digital aspect of this, how does CNN uh, compete with online TV streaming services such as Netflix? And how do you think Netflix and CNN and other, how do you think that's moving forward? And yeah, well, what look, I mean, Netflix is an incredibly, you know, whether it's Netflix or Hulu or Amazon, uh, you know, they're all incredible, HBO Go, they're all incredibly strong uh, services. They're not doing what we're doing, we're not trying to do what they're doing, right? So uh, people are gonna get their entertainment and their programming from those outlets. I think what they're gonna come to us for is something very different, which is to be informed. In, in the United States, uh, those streaming services have really become the de facto TV networks and people put together their own TV network by deciding what shows they want to watch. Um, but there's still no other place uh, to get your news and information and it's part of why all of the cable news channels in the United States are enjoying record renaissance ratings uh, and audiences because there is a tremendous thirst and appetite for, uh, for news and information about what's going on in Washington and the world. And so I don't think we're, we're not, we, don't, we don't see, listen, Netflix and those other services are competitors because everything's a competition for time, right? But they're not a competitor in terms of, of doing the same thing we do. And if they started to, how would well, you if they started to go into respond? the news business? Listen, here's the thing. It's really hard to do, it's really hard to go into the news business and do what we do in terms of covering the world. Uh, the amount of investment and resources that we put in uh, is not easily duplicated. Now, could Netflix do it because they have all the money in the world? Uh, I'm sure they could if they wanted to, but it also, brand equity is built over time, and so you trust CNN because you know they've been there for 37 years in the Gulf War, or, or, in, you know, or in North Korea, or in Washington, wherever it is. That doesn't happen overnight, and that takes a long time. Um, but, uh, you know, but if Netflix wants to do it, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't uh, ever suggest that they couldn't do it, and they should give me a call. <laughs> so, kind of touching on that, where do you see yourself going next? You've been president of CNN for a little while. Five years, And yeah. uh, you're clearly facing your own challenges. You're quite busy at the moment. Um, but where do you see your future heading? I don't know. Um, I've never really known where I was going next. You know, I spent 25 years at NBC uh, and now five years at CNN. Um, but even within those 25 years, 
I never, um, I never really knew what was next, and I never certainly intended to stay at NBC for 25 years. I went to NBC because I didn't get into to law school. Um, I'd like to apply now and see what happens. Um, <laughs> but uh, you know, I didn't get into law school, so I went to uh, work at NBC Sports on the Olympics. Uh, uh, that led to somebody asking me if I wanted to come to the Today Show. I said I'd never really seen the Today Show before, but why not? Uh, you know, uh, I was running the Today Show, which was news. They said, would you like to come run NBC Entertainment? I said, okay. I moved to Los Angeles and did that. We put The Apprentice on the air. Uh, you know, and then I went back to New York. So I never had like a game plan of what I was gonna do. And so it's the same thing now. Listen, I've had five great years at CNN. I've loved it. Um, uh, I, don't, uh, uh, I don't really have a, a, a game plan as to how long that goes or what comes next. But um, for the time being, I'm very content and, and happy to be at CNN. And whatever happens next, time will tell. And you've obviously had such a prolific career in the media. What kind of reflections do you have from that time? What kind of lessons have you learned? And what advice would you give to any aspiring journalists so sitting here? So I think here? the most uh, important advice I would give uh, to people who want to be journalists is uh, to not be, uh, um, not be cowered by uh, those in authority who want to um, uh, throw you off the, off the course. Journalism is an incredibly noble profession. Uh, I think we're seeing that now more than ever, that it's incredibly important to expose uh, wrongdoing and to hold those in power accountable. Um, but they're always gonna wanna try to um, bully you into uh, not doing what you're doing. Write an email like the one you referred to earlier about being disloyal, uh, uh, try to get you not to report uh, the latest allegations of wrongdoing. Don't be, don't be coward, don't be bullied. Uh, journalism is incredibly important, never more so than today. And, uh, and if it is what you wanna do, follow your passion and uh, follow your dreams and do it. Brilliant. I think that's all that I'm going to ask you about. It's a nice night to end, uh, note to end on. Um, so we're now gonna move to questions from the audience. So if you'd like to ask a question, please raise your hand and wait for the microphone. And if you could also stand up. Um, could we go to the young lady in the front row, please? Um, CNN has a very large and diverse audience, so aside from the breaking stories that everyone wants to know about, how do you prioritize which stories to run? Yeah, so uh, on our digital platforms, we're, uh, we're covering the world and we try to cover as much as we can uh, and, and make, make sure that we're on every story possible. That's the philosophy and the strategy for the digital platforms. On television, it's slightly different. Uh, we have obviously two main uh, channels, the CNN US channel and the CNN international channel. They are different. Uh, on the international channel, uh, it's really meant to cover the world and a little less US centric, although now everybody wants to know about the US uh, in terms of its politics and what's going on. So there is quite a bit more American politics on that channel than there used to be. Uh, but in the U.S., we've really uh, honed it down to covering the two or three or maybe four big stories of the day, and that's it. And we do try to, try to strategize as to what those most important stories of the day are. It used to be, though, that CNN covered, you know, tried to, to cover, you know, 20 stories a day. Our philosophy is entirely different now because we think you're getting those 20 stories a day on your phone or from our digital platforms or whatever. We're covering more stories than we ever did. We're just not putting them all on television. And, you know, I mean, if you think about this week alone uh, on the CNN US network, you know, you have the massacre in, in Texas uh, at the, the shooting at the church. You have uh, a, a potential biggest tax bill uh, reform in the United States in 30 years. You have Donald Trump on, on you know, the, the biggest trip of his presidency. Um, there, there is, uh, and, and last night, election day in the United States. There's, there's no shortage of, of stories, and, and each one of those is incredibly important. So this week, we're probably covering those four stories. 
There's a hundred other stories that are deserving of attention. They're not going to get the attention on the, on, on the TV channel uh, because we're just not in the game of, of covering all of them anymore. But we are going to cover them digitally. Great, thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, can we go to the young man? Yep. Thanks. Hello. Um, so some critics have said that the way C CNN presents information, such as, for example, you have anti-Trump supporters having like a f an hour-long discussion with An uh, Anderson Cooper, kind of resulting in a screaming match, where um, they accuse you of like sort of legitimizing these viewpoints. What's your response to that? Legitimizing what? I'm sorry. Like, for example, really extreme viewpoints yeah. by like the two or three right. anti-Trump supporters. Right. So um, this is a criticism that I've heard. Uh, uh, before. Um, here's been my view of this. We, we, have, we have gotten criticism because we have Trump supporters on our air. I, 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 don't, I don't accept that criticism. The idea that we shouldn't have pro-Trump points of view I think runs contrary to who we are and what we're trying to be. The fact is if you want to run, want to watch only pro-Trump points of view, then you'll watch, uh, you'll watch Fox News Channel. If you want to hear people who are 100% anti-Trump, you'll watch MSNBC. If you want to try to understand where both sides are coming from, then hopefully CNN can present that. What we're going to do is we're going to present the facts first, we're going to present the, 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 uh, the truth, which you won't get on either of the other channels in its entirety, and then you're going to hear from both sides as to why they think something works or doesn't work, why Trump is doing what he's doing, why he's not doing what he's doing. And, and obviously we have people from both sides. We have gotten criticized for this, and I think those who are criticizing us aren't, uh, uh, are, are exposing their own bias in not being willing to hear from the other side. And you know, the criticism is, oh, well, they're, they're, not, they're not being honest and they're not telling the truth. Well, you know what? First of all, Anderson Cooper can call them out on that, and the audience can decide for themselves. But to not hear that point of view, I think, is its own bias. Thank you. Thank you for the question as well. Um, can we go to this person here <laughs> in the red jumper? I'm aware there. Thank you very much for being here. I do you believe that there's a tension between political coverage as news and political coverage as entertainment? And if so, does a for-profit news organization like CNN have a greater responsibility to try to elevate our national dialogue or pursue ratings? Yeah. So uh, is there some tension? Oh, of course there's some tension. I, I, our, you know, our primary goal is to, uh, is to cover the news and present the news uh, and, and to uh, do it on a global basis, on a, on a daily basis. Now, look, we are, our, we are also in the television business, right? So this idea that, you know, we should just be boring, I reject. If I want that, well, I won't say something. That would get me in a lot of trouble <laughs> over here. I'd get in a lot of trouble over here. But there are plenty of boring uh, television news channels. Um, uh, <laughs> why, why do we need to be boring? Okay? We are doing television. And the other thing is, we do also need to attract an audience, right? You say we're running a for-profit uh, channel. Yes, we, we are running a business. That is true. You know what that business allows us to do? To have a correspondent in, in Pyongyang today for his 17th trip in there. To be in Africa covering everything that's happening in, in Africa. To have two correspondents in, in, in Russia on a continuing basis. Uh, to cover the world like no other, certainly American television network can. Okay? That costs money. And so as a result, we need to invest. And the way we invest is we make money. And the way we make money is we have audiences. And the way we have audiences is we do a good job and make it engaging and, and, and bring in uh, viewership. I think this idea that, that, that you can do good journalism 
and, and also not be interesting. They are not mutually exclusive. And, uh, and so I think our job is to cover the news, present the facts, uh, and, and do it in an important uh, way. But that doesn't mean we need to be boring. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do you want to see some people? Um, can we go to you just here, actually? Hi. Um, what does your, your media diet consist of, I guess? Like, yeah. what do you read? What do you watch? Yeah. <laughs> A lot. <laughs> A lot. No. Um, Besides Sienna. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, you know, look, uh, probably, um, you know, I, I, I fully consume the New York Times, the Washington Post. Uh, I check out Daily Beast, Huffington Post, LA Times in a skimming kind of way. Um, uh, I watch, believe it or not, I watch a lot of Fox News. <laughs> and people are surprised by that. But I do it because I want to know what they're saying and how they're presenting. You know, I watch it mostly for entertainment, <laughs> but, but I do, because it's funny, actually. It's actually more, f it's, actually, it's actually like better than most comedies that are on uh, US television. But, but you know what? It's important to watch how they're doing it and, uh, and to know what's out there. So I consume a lot of that. Um, uh, say those are, the, those, those are the principal uh, things I consume. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. The, that was an interesting question. And, and, and I, I, I follow Twitter pretty. I, 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 I follow Twitter to see where the conversation is. What are your top Twitter accounts that you like? Uh, you know, I don't know. I, I mean, I follow a hundred different accounts and I follow a lot of the, the places that I just noted, but you know, then the conversations veer off of that. I just like to see where the conversation is. Thanks. Okay. Um, can we go to... She's calling on people, right? So don't hold yet. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> None of this. Me, me, me. Um, can we go to the back sitting down? Sorry. I'm not making this guy run around. <laughs> yeah, just in the middle. So with respect to the politicization of news, um, you defended political news organizations um, in the name of free speech. On the other hand, you said you would defend the regulation of social media outlets. So firstly, what's the nature of regulation that you would defend? And secondly, how would you reconcile those regulations with the value that you place on free speech? Yeah. So what I mean by that is there are, I, I do think that there are regulations that are in place on things like political advertising uh, in terms of uh, the need to uh, uh, have uh, sourcing and, and facts associated with them. Otherwise, I think you do end up with fake news uh, uh, you know, being transmitted on, on those platforms. So, I mean, I do think that the regulation of political advertising in particular uh, is, is something that's important. And, uh, um, but I think infringing upon, uh, infringing upon, um, you know, freedom of speech and things like that is not something that I'm comfortable with. Yeah, cool. Thank you. Um, can we go to this person here in the hat? Yeah. Thank you. Um, my question is um, in sort of a similar vein to one that was asked earlier. But in the wake of the 2016 election, there's been a criticism that um, the big mainstream media outlets, CNN of course included, um, are in a way responsible for Trump's election because of the sheer amount of airtime and yeah. coverage that was given to him. Um, there have been like you know graphic uh, graphs submitted or whatever like studies done that show just how wide the gap is between the coverage of Trump and the coverage of the other mm -hmm. Republican nominees or, or or the Democratic nominees. Um, so how would you respond to that? Yeah. Crisis? So uh, yeah, there's been a lot of uh, uh, a lot of um, conversation around that and a lot of reports that have been done. H here's what I'd say. Um, I don't think that the media is why Donald Trump is president of the United States. Uh, I, think, I think there is a large segment of the population in the United States that wants to blame somebody for Donald Trump being president, and the media becomes an easy target, right? 
But the media is not the one that told all of his competitors uh, not to do interviews while he agreed to do every interview. Uh, you know, just to put some meat on that bone. You know, we invited Donald Trump on to do interviews all the time. He said yes. We invited Jeb Bush and Marco Rubio and Ted Cruz on to do interviews all the time. And they said no. It's not, it's not our responsibility. We're not going to say, okay, well, Trump, you can't come on because they, your competitors said no. I think what happened in 2016, 2015, uh, is that many of those candidates did not react to the, to the new world in which distribution uh, through social media and through cable, cable news, they, did, they were running an old game and an old playbook. Trump, to his credit, understood that new media world and he took advantage of it. There's no question about it. But that's not the media's fault. And now, did the media make mistakes? Yes. Have I, have I stood up uh, and said that, did we put on too many of Donald Trump's uh, early campaign rallies uh, uh, and we shouldn't have done that? Uh, yes. Did our competitors do the same thing? Did Fox and MSNBC do the same thing? Yes. Have they ever acknowledged that they made the mistake? No. But that's okay. I'm not looking for that. We, <laughs> we, we, I, I've said so. We, you know, we, we, now, do I think because we put all those on, that's why he's president? I don't. Okay? By the way, uh, Donald Trump's uh, voters are not in large part watching CNN like that, okay? So this idea that we influence the Republican primary voters is ridiculous, okay? <laughs> it's silly. But again, I think people are looking to blame, blame people and so the media becomes, CNN becomes an easy target. I understand that. Um, but the idea that we, we held this sway over Republican primary voters and as a result, we're the ones who, who influenced the Republican primary voters to, to select Donald Trump is silly. Did we make mistakes? I just acknowledged we made mistakes. Is that why he's president? It is not. Thank you for your question. Um, let's go to this lady right here. Yeah, with the glasses. Um, there's a lot of talk about how in the current climate, um, people are so polarized in their views that they kind of choose their media outlet yeah. based on their the view they already hold. So do you think there's actually any any room in that climate for journalism to sort of change people's minds and actually influence their opinion? Yeah. So uh, it's, it's an important question. Um, uh, I think it's hard to change people's minds. It, go, it goes back to part of why, you know, the criticism that we get for having Trump folks on our air, I think is silly because what those people are looking for is not to have any of that point of view on our air. And I think that if you don't hear from both sides, it, it, it's silly. Um, do I think that there's room? I agree with your premise that, that people are, are in large part seeking out their own points of view to be reinforced. There, there is a good deal of that. Um, but that's why I do think that uh, places like CNN retain incredibly important roles in our society because we're willing to actually listen to both sides. I do think that the biggest issue in, in American po politics, though I go back to, is not the partisanship of the media, but I think it's, it's, it's the gerrymandering of electoral districts that doesn't allow for, uh, that just that keeps safe seats uh, rigged in, uh, in re-electing people from the same party, and I think that's the biggest, biggest issue. Thank you. Um, let's go to this person here. Thanks for uh, coming to talk. Um, so my question relates to, with the recent uh, shootings and terrorist attacks in the United States, I've seen some journalists talk about maybe not reporting the names yeah. of these lone wolf attackers. So I was wondering what your thoughts were on that yeah. as like a self-imposed policy yeah. in the newsroom. Where are you from? I'm from Phoenix. Phoenix, yeah. So um, it's a really interesting question. Um, and I would say that we have this debate internally at CNN quite a bit. We have several anchors at CNN who decline to, to name the shooters or the terrorists or whatever. And, uh, and I, I, I think that that's totally within their rights. Uh, they don't want to glorify the killer, they don't want to give any 
uh, credibility to them. They don't want to um, give any, any, anyone else who would think, be thinking that way the idea that they would uh, get any glory from doing something like that. We have several anchors who, who take that, have taken that position. I'm totally comfortable with that. As an entire overall network, I have held to the belief that I think it's important to use the name because I think we are in the business of reporting what we know. And, uh, and that um, holding back on that name, uh, I think, you know, I don't, I don't believe that it uh, leads the next person to do something. There are people who do, and I'm not going to say that they have, you know, that, 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 that Anderson Cooper is wrong because he, he thinks that. Okay, he, he, he decides on his show that he's not going to name them. That's certainly uh, a valid point of view. Uh, I think um, I have a, a different point of view, although I will say, listen, it's not you know, clear cut, and, and I think good people can disagree on this, but I have taken the position that I think we're, we, we, we are in the business of reporting what we know, uh, and as a result, we should report the name. But it's a very hard call. Thanks. Um, okay, let's go to. I can't see some people. Um, this guy, you've been you've been waiting for a while. <laughs> so, um, at CNN, <coughs> sorry, in making editorial decisions at CNN, um, how do journalists sort of split the balance between reporting on stories that they think that people need to hear and reporting on stories that they think people want to hear. And um, in asking that question, I guess I'm reminded of uh, CNN's thing with Malaysian Airlines, uh, the disappearance of a flight, and CNN covered it for weeks. And uh, I'm just wondering, what does that decision-making process sort of look like? Yeah, well, you're looking at it. <laughs> um, uh, so, um, you know, listen, I, I, I think that uh, I think our role is to cover both what people want to know and what people should know. Right. And I think that we have to try to do both. Now, again, I go back to the fact that people are thinking about CNN in the same way that they historically thought about CNN in that, you know, you give us 22 minutes, we'll give you the world. Right. That's just not the way that's not the way we see it now. Uh, we are covering. So, so I'll go to your example of the Malaysian airliner, uh, where the disappearance of that airliner, and we covered, covered it pretty nonstop for the four or five weeks after it happened, something like that. Um, we, were still covering, we were still covering all the, the world's events, but we were doing it on our digital properties. We weren't doing it on television. That is true. But at the same time, we are, we're also covering uh, um, the, the Russian in, uh, incursion invasion of Ukraine at that time. And we had, we had many reporters there. And so, you know, if we were covering the, the airliner 90% of the time, and we were covering Ukraine 10% of the time, and those were the two big stories of the time, nobody actually paid attention to the fact that we were covering Ukraine because they all, uh, you know, we were giving more coverage to Ukraine than anybody else on television. But all anybody paid attention to was the fact that we were covering the airliner. I get it. I get it, uh, uh, because they wanted to be critical of us. I understand. Um, uh, listen, we make those decisions. It goes back to what we were talking about before. Uh, you know, we're also, we're also running a business. We're also um, uh, making those decisions. I think we are covering more than we've ever covered. We're just doing it on digital. We're not doing it on television. And, um, uh, and uh, you know, and I own that decision. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, I own that decision. I admitted we made mistakes. What more do you want from me? <laughs> <laughs> Let's go to the person by the fireplace. Uh, so, in light of recent allegations made of sexual harassment in the workplace by politicians, U.S. presidents, um, by media executives, Hollywood executives, what responsibility do you see the media industry has in combating that? And also, what steps have you personally taken to help combat sexual harassment in the workplace? Yeah. So, uh, I think that 
what role does the media play in that is, um, I think the media deserves a tremendous amount of credit here for exposing uh, uh, a lot of this. I mean, the fact is, you know, pursuing these stories has not been easy. Obviously, the women who have come forward are, are the real heroes and being willing to, to tell their stories. But the media, uh, I think, has done some extraordinary reporting in exposing what's going on. Uh, and I think that, uh, you know, uh, num numerous outlets ha have just done uh, an amazing job at that. At CNN, you know, we're doing a, a global town hall tomorrow night uh, on this very topic, uh, the t tipping point of, of, of changing the, the conversation on sexual harassment. That's a global town hall tomorrow night. I, or I can't think. Maybe it's Thursday night. I'm sorry. I don't know what day it is. Uh, Thursday night. It's, yeah, it's tomorrow night. Uh, tomorrow night. Um, and so, you know, continuing to, to cover that has been impor incredibly important for CNN. From my standpoint, what I've personally done, look, I, I think that uh, much, of, much of this involves uh, um, direction and leadership from the top. And that if you, uh, you have to lead by example and, and have a zero tolerance uh, for anything like that. Uh, I, I would like to believe that that, that is fully understood at CNN and, uh, and why, um, uh, you know, as, as far as I am aware, uh, there have been no uh, issues like this. Um, uh, but it's clear that, that we have a zero tolerance, and I'd like to say that, you know, uh, that comes from the top, and there will be no, uh, uh, no tolerance for anything like that. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, let's go to the person with the beige jumper with their hand up. <laughs> no, no, keep going back. Sorry. He has a watch on as well. They have a watch on. Um, I don't think the criticism is that, in particular, that you have different perspectives on the panel shows. It's more that, and this is to the previous question, um, it's more to do with the fact that you know, at one of the pivotal moments in American history, the election in 2016, you would have, some people would say, screaming matches. And not just that, but you would also have regularly similar people on with very polarized viewpoints. And some people would say that that isn't what journalism should be about. It should be about the pursuit of higher values. So we're aiming for informing the population mm -hmm. as to where politicians may be lying to you, um, the blind spots that you may not be immediately getting. Uh, it shouldn't really be about entertainment. And I understand that it's about the pursuit of business as well. You need to get eyeballs on screens. But as you were saying, the CNN should be about the truth mm -hmm. and it shouldn't be about, I think, what we are seeing a lot of at the moment. Yeah. So look, I think that, um, I, I, by the way, I, I understand that and I don't, I don't, uh, I, I understand your point of view and I don't um, uh, run from it. Um, I guess my only pushback on it would be uh, that, you know, we are on 24 hours a day. And, um, you know, if, if from time to time there is a very heated exchange between uh, Van Jones and Jeffrey Lord, or, or whomever, you know, uh, and, and that there is, uh, you know, and from time to time there is, uh, I mean, I think we all have to recognize emotions have run incredibly high in the United States around the political story for the last two years, right? And if, if from time to time that, uh, that um, is displayed on, on the air, I, I don't I don't think that's an issue um, that doesn't mean that you know you can't the other 23 hours a day you know have completely civil conversations or 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 whatever again it's a little bit like the airliner right I mean the things that get a disproportionate amount of attention are the things that that you know are highly charged uh, and those emotional fights uh, you know become viral videos and, and conversation starters. You know, that's not the norm, but it exists. And, you know, I think that what that reflects is the emotion that exists around this story. Um, and I think to say that we're not going to have any of that is both naive and, and, and not, uh, not representative of, of the current emotional climate that exists around the American political story. And so, I, I don't think that we should uh, say that that's not going to be part of the story. 
Otherwise, it becomes probably, listen, people are having emotional fights around their dinner tables every night in the United States around this stuff. Um, to not reflect that on the air, I think, would be not telling the full story. I think we have time for one or two more questions. So um, can I go to the person in the blue jumper with their hand up? Uh, to move a little bit away from that topic, how do you think the consolidation in the American media has changed the way the news is done? And do you think people like Jeff Bezos buying the Washington Post will change the way the news is done in the future? Well, look, I mean, I think you have to argue that the best thing that ever happened to the Washington Post was Jeff Bezos buying it. Uh, the fact is the Washington Post had become a uh, second-rate local newspaper. And now, you know, it's either the first or second best newspaper in America. So thank God Jeff Bezos bought the Washington Post. Um, and, you know, as I said, uh, this is a pretty heady time for American journalism. Uh, uh, yes, uh, American uh, media is going through, uh, certain parts of American media are going through a difficult time because because the model is changing and, you know, news magazines and print publications to some degree are struggling, but other, other publications are stepping up and doing incredible work. And, uh, and so that's the nature of, of the way the world works, you know. Um, uh, you know, there was print and then radio came along and then, and then television came along and then satellite television came along and then social media came along and business models change. We're going through one of those times uh, but I don't think it's necessarily uh, been to the detriment of, of American journalism, which I said I think is going through an incredibly heady time right now. Okay, we have time for one final question. Um, sorry, I'm trying to like make sure I haven't missed anyone. Um, let's go to you in the glasses, yeah. Hello, uh, thanks for coming. Just uh, as kind of a follow-up to that question, uh, what would you, how would you respond to the media organization uh, Sinclair, which is kind of this big, you know, conservative media organization that's buying up uh, local stations all around the country? I think they just bought uh, Tribune Media. Um, and doesn't that kind of conflict with getting diverse viewpoints and, um, you know, a, a variety of information if it's all kind of, you know, they have these kind of mandatory segments that have to go out everywhere. Boris Epstein. Sure. So I'm wondering what your uh, take on that is. Yeah, look, um, you know, there used to be uh, rules in the United States that, you, that uh, there was a limit to the number of local television stations or media outlets that you could own. Uh, and I think that was actually a good rule, going back to the questions that were asked of me before about what kinds of regulations I think are important. I do think that, um, I do think that uh, uh, having some limit on cross-ownership of newspapers and television stations and the amount of television stations you can own, I do think there is some value in that. Um, but that was busted a long time ago by a guy named Rupert Murdoch. I don't know if you've heard of him. <laughs> and, um, and so, look, I think that that is something to be uh, wary of. Uh, and so, so I, I understand your concern. On the other hand, uh, on the other hand, um, we are in an incredibly interesting time of new forms of distribution and, uh, and people uh, are um, able to, to get their stories and their information out through all these new means of distribution and that's an incredibly exciting turn of events for everyone. So I think your concern is valid. Um, I would think that, that some of those regulations that used to be in place uh, did have some import, but, um, but uh, there's also new ways of, of exposing news and information. Brilliant. Thank you for your question. I'm afraid that's all we have time for, but thank you so much for your contributions. Uh, would you join me in thanking Jeff Sucker? <laughs> <laughs>